and welcome to the Oral History Project of Criminology. I am Sharis Kubrin and I am here to interview Professor Robert D. Crutchfield. We are in New Orleans for the 2016 American Society of Criminology meeting. Um, and today we're going to talk about the life and distinguished career of Professor Crutchfield and as one of his early students, not the earliest, but early, uh, I'm very excited and honored to be able to do this. Um, so just a quick introduction before we get into the questions. Um, Robert Crutchfield is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Sociology at the University of Washington with affiliations in American Ethnic Studies and Social Work. He is also a member of the Racial Democracy, Crime and Justice Network. He received his BA in Sociology from Thiel College in Pennsylvania and his MA and PhD at Vanderbilt University. Professor Crutchfield's research encompasses two main areas, uh, first labor markets and crime, and second, race, ethnicity, and the criminal justice system. He has numerous publications in both areas, too many to review here, but I'll just highlight a recently published book titled Get a Job, Labor Markets, Economic Opportunity, and Crime, uh, which I highly recommend that everyone should read. Um, Professor Crutchfield has served in a number of important administrative positions during his career. He was elected vice president of the American Society of Criminology. He was chair of the American Sociological Association's Crime Law and Deviance section. Um, he was elected to the Council of ASA. He served on a number of National Academies of Sciences committees um, related to a number of important topics. Um, Professor Crutchfield has been on the Washington State Juvenile Sentencing Commission and the Board for Washington State Council on Crime and Delinquency. He's currently on the Board of Directors of the Sentencing Project. And most people don't know this, but he is a former juvenile probation officer and worked as a parole agent for the Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole before he entered academia, and we're going to ask him about that in a little bit. Um, Professor Crutchfield also served two terms as department chair in sociology at the University of Washington, and there's even more service I could list, but I will stop there. Uh, Professor Crutchfield has received a bevy of awards for which he is most deserving, such as the Legacy of Excellence Award from the University of Washington, the University of Washington's Distinguished Teaching Award, the Fellows Award from the Western Society of Criminology, and the Cora Mae Ritchie Mann Award from the Division on People of Color and Crime of the American Society of Criminology for his contributions to um, scholarship on race, ethnicity, crime, and justice. And perhaps most illustrative of his intellectual contributions to the field in 2011, Bob was named a fellow of the American Society of Criminology. So Bob, thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> so let's get started. Okay. Start off asking a few questions on your trajectory of becoming a criminologist, but we'll start in the early years. Um, now, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, your route to academia was not straightforward. Um, after getting your undergraduate degree in sociology, you went on to become a juvenile probation officer and also work as a parole agent um, for the Pennsylvania Board of Pro Probation and Parole. So can you tell me a little bit about what put you in that direction, what your experience there was like? Uh, chance. Um, I uh, was actually, after I graduated from Teal College, um, hanging out waiting to get drafted um, because I had a low draft number and Vietnam War was heavy and I was not thrilled about the possibility but options were limited and I uh, uh, actually went to back to Greenville, Pennsylvania where Teal was located to see my girlfriend mm -hmm. uh, and while I was waiting to get that, that draft notice and uh, while there a friend who uh, had been working as a juvenile PO uh, in, in Mercer County, Pennsylvania, said, I'm leaving my job, you ought to apply for it. And I just happened to be there when he at, at this moment, so I applied. And that was, was the probation enough, That was the, ju the juvenile, juvenile probation job, mm -hmm. and, and was fortunate enough to get the job. Um, and I stayed there for a year um, before leaving for, to go to uh, work as a parole agent for the um, Board of Probation and Parole in Pennsylvania. So just just by chance. chance. I mean, but you know, in your sociology degree, had you taken any courses related to I, this topic? Did you have any substantive interests in this, or was it more? To some extent, yeah. I yeah. was. I had taken a criminology course and a deviance course as an undergraduate, uh, like like so many people do, and uh, I, I was interested in the topics. Um, um, but mostly, I you know, I, I thought when I was uh, finishing college um, about graduate school. Um, but military service was going to get in the way because mm -hmm. you could get a deferment for um, uh, undergraduate education but not for graduate education. So uh, I had a pretty good idea that that was going to be put off because of my low draft number. Mm -hmm. And so I was 
not really thinking much about you know career lines and what I was going to do. Um, while I was working as a juvenile PO at my that small college, one of my old teachers asked me to come back and talk to the students about what did I learn there. Uh -huh. um, that's exactly yeah, the question yeah, I was yeah, going to yeah, ask yeah. you. Is what or what do you remember? What were some of the highlights of that well, experience? Well, yeah, you know, one was it, it was a, it's Teal's very small school, and um, and and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but but uh, we didn't have many people in sociology, and mm -hmm. so uh, when one um, man joined the faculty, Amro Todd, who had an interest in criminology, it was like this boom, big opening up of an area that you know there hadn't been much. Uh, until um, Professor Todd uh, came and started ordering, uh, offering a course in criminology, and I and I took that class and, and, and enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Um, and he's the one that asked me to come back and talk to one of his classes about what I'd learned there that was helpful in my job as as, uh, as a PO. And I had to be honest, um, and I told the students what I'd learned most um, there was how to write. Uh, it wasn't from the substance of, of criminology. <laughs> that is not what I was expecting sociology. you to say. No, uh -huh. it, was, it was it was because what you had to do as as a, as a working um, a parole officer was you had to write lots of reports mm -hmm. and 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 you know to, to learn to put a coherent sentence together. You know, sounds like an easy thing, but it's it's sort of the fundamentals of a liberal arts education. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that that I got most out of going to school there was was. Uh, was, was the criminology and the sociology was good and I enjoyed it and, and I became a social major not because I went there intending to but you know sort of I realized when I had to declare a major that uh, that I'd taken a lot of these courses and I'd right. taken a lot of these courses because they were fascinating and they were mm -hmm. interesting um, but criminology was one of the a number of things that I thought was interesting mm -hmm. and, you know it wasn't sort of didn't hold me at that point so what the thing I think most important was that I learned to, to uh, not, I'm not saying write elegantly or great, but, but competently uh, was, was what it was what I took away from that. Now let me ask you a question about what what impressions about crime and criminality or or criminal behavior did you take away from? How many years were you there? It was like four. Or five. No, I was I was juvenile for a year and two years with with um, with uh, adult parole. Adult, so so three, three total. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. in that in that time, were there any? I wouldn't say theory, but any any observations that that led that, that we'll get to where it went eventually. Okay. But what stuck out to you about crime criminality in that experience? Well, one a little bit of context: in the neighborhood I grew up in, mm -hmm. um, uh, inner city Pittsburgh, housing projects in Pittsburgh, um, sort of colored everything that I, I came to do, uh, not only there but later. Um, you know, I had the experience of. Uh, of going to a, a, a training that had been um, funded by the LEAA, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, which was our early um, Nixon administration mm -hmm. get tough on crime activity. And lots of that had to do with um, sort of improving the quality of law enforcement and corrections people. And so there were lots of training things. Uh, and one of those, uh, I was I, I met some people who were uh, working in probation and parole in Allegheny County, which is the county in which Pittsburgh is, and. Um, they, talking to them, I got to know that a number of people I'd gone to high school with were on their caseload. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was just like, oh, you know, one of those there but by the grace of God go I. Mm -hmm. I had the experience of when I was a parole officer of uh, going for training sessions at uh, Western State Penitentiary outside of Pittsburgh uh, and having uh, uh, a resident, as they refer to them, inmate, mm -hmm. uh, those of us who refer to them, seeing my name <laughs> tag uh, and saying, Crutchfield, do you know Jim Crutchfield? I said, he's my brother. Uh, mm -hmm. And this person had gone to high school with my brother, and he was now in, in, uh, doing serious time in, in, in the penitentiary. Um, my cohort hadn't graduated to uh, the maximum Get security pr yeah. prison yet. They were working their way through the system. But a number of people we'd gone to high school with um, um, were doing time. A number of people we went to high school with um, were killed um, in, in street stuff or in, during crime commission commission committing crimes uh, or drug overdoses. So that was the context in which mm -hmm. I went to, um, to do that work. So as, as a PO, what I wanted to do as much as anything else is I wanted to be um, that person who understood um, their mm -hmm. background, not academically. Who got the context. But, yeah, right. Yeah, it wasn't that I understood academically because I didn't yeah. have that much training. I was, you know, I was a, I started as a 21 year old with a BA in sociology mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, uh, all of a sudden I was supposed to know what I was doing. I uh, had the, the shocking experience of, of uh, the first time I was in court having read rec written recommendations for the judge and, his, uh, and having his, uh, him read into order 
an order of probation for this kid. Uh, my exact words, as mm -hmm. if I was the grand expert, and I'm like, but I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, very much. I, I learned a lot uh, yeah. over the over the coming years. I uh, I learned a lot about crime and criminal justice, you know, in, in that time. Uh, um, and I and I think, you know, it, it, it shaped the criminologist I became. Like, right. I mean, is this where you got your first interest in context and and structure, the broader neighborhood forces? Uh, Neighborhood, I was sort of just understood, you yeah, know, because, yeah. because I, you know, I knew the difference between where I lived and where um, other people I came to know lived, you uh -huh. know, and, and 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 you know, and I knew how, you know, I didn't use the language of, of sociology or criminology to talk about life chances, right? But, you know, but you 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 grow up in in those settings and you know that life chances are shaped by uh, the context in which you grow up, and so mm -hmm. you see, you see that you can see that. Um, uh, I had a caseload uh, as a juvenile PO, and I had kids from middle class communities uh, who would get in trouble because they would drink and do silly stuff with the cars that their parents brought them, uh, and other kids from um, um, small town but inner city ass neighborhoods mm -hmm. that, that were really pretty disadvantaged. And you could see that. So, mm -hmm. so, so some of that was certainly colored by that. But um, one of the, you know, I, I learned a lot about crime and. Cr and criminals, you know, from the street perspective, the perspective of, right. of, of people who worked on the street. The other thing I learned is I didn't like doing probation and parole work. Right, because uh, you were only there for three years. Yeah, right, yeah. So I, what what didn't you like about it, and what made you look to something else? There was there was a, a, a moment I realized that um, that uh, you know, at one point the, the, the parole board decided that they needed to not only just uh, say bad things to us and get you know you, know, you screwed up this or that, and, you know. And, uh, but they needed to give us positive memos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that uh, I was the only agent in my office that never got a positive memo. Now, I had the lowest return rate in terms of people going back to prison. My guys were getting in less trouble. But what I didn't do a very good job at is I didn't like writing reports. And so I didn't take mm -hmm. them as seriously as I should. So I didn't dot every uh, I, cross every mm -hmm. T. Uh, you know, and, and I didn't do the bureaucratic part of it because I didn't want to do the bureaucratic part of it. Yeah, that was the least interesting. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I thought, you know, do I want to? Want to do this, and then I had a moment of of, uh, of uh, getting a new person on my caseload. Never going to be on parole for ten years, and I remember looking at his files and reviewing it because I was going to interview him that afternoon. And I looked and said, "Wow, in ten years he's going to be off, and I'm going to still be here." <laughs> that <laughs> reality like, hit reality. you in the face. And I went home that day and started writing the graduate pro program. For okay, <laughs> hold on. So in, uh, that makes complete sense. The leaving, but yeah. why graduate school? Why not something else? I, I had thought about it mm -hmm. before, and but didn't pursue it in, in, a, in a very serious way because uh, uh, because of the draft. Um, but by uh, by you know 1973, when I started writing those letters. Um, I, I had dodged the draft successfully, at mm -hmm. least at that point it seemed that I was going to be in. turns out that I did. Uh, I didn't do anything illegal to get out, but you know, I certainly used every, every means and mechanism in, you know, in my power to avoid um, uh, heading to Vietnam. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so I thought about it and I thought I wanted to do this. Uh, but even as I was writing, I was um, uh, not, it wasn't my intention to go and study criminology. Mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to go and be a sociologist mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. had other areas of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so, that's, that's so then you move on to Vanderbilt for the MA and PhD. Was Vanderbilt where you wanted to be or was Vanderbilt where you ended up? Um, it's hard to phrase. I applied to a lot of places, you know. Mm -hmm. I was newly married uh, and I thought I needed to be in a place where uh, my wife could um, could uh, have some success getting, you know, looking for work. Mm -hmm. So, um, a smaller place and a rural place was was, um, was probably not in the cards. And I applied to, to a lot of places. Um, uh, probably the place I most wanted to be was Penn State, where I did mm -hmm. a lot of training things. They didn't accept me, so I didn't, didn't end up there. Um, I uh, ended up at, at Vanderbilt primarily because um, one of my teachers at, at Teal, uh, Jeff Reynolds, uh, had taught me with a master's degree, and he decided he wanted a PhD, and he'd gone to Vanderbilt. Uh, and um, Vanderbilt was the best graduate program I'd applied to, mm -hmm. um, and uh, my grades were uh, okay at Teal, but they weren't great. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd started out rough. I mean, mm -hmm. I was the inner city kid going to college, and thought I was very prepared when I went, went, to, went to Teal, but um, wasn't Adjustment. ready. You know, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and the grades suffered, and so. Uh, so, so Vanderbilt was, was, was a very solid program. Uh, 
that I applied to because he said I should, and I tried, and I think he convinced them that they should take a chance on me. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was, they were, weren't sure, and, um, and, and so they gave me a chance, and you know, and I went pretty much just with uh, a tuition waiver. I didn't have funding um, okay. because I was, was one of their highly ranked recruits or anything like that. So, uh-huh. so, so, so Vanderbilt was a place, and it, and it fit because what I realized before I. You know, during the process, what I really wanted to do was I, I was interested in um, social movements, and there was mm-hmm. a very good social movements person there. Uh, so, so I was going to go to Vanderbilt and study social movements, and uh, and, and largely because Jeff was there. So it was a great thing they took a chance on you, uh, right? Good for we me. wouldn't be sitting here today <laughs> if they didn't take a chance. Yeah, Chances good are good. Yeah. I think it was a good chance. I mean, it was a calculated chance. Yeah. Um, so when you were at Vanderbilt. Who were your mentors? What what did you did you start developing then your interest in, in your labor market? I mean, what how did that come about? Yeah, uh, when, I, when I got there, I mean, the person I wanted to um, to uh, work with was was Anthony Obershaw, mm-hmm. uh, who was a uh, social movement scholar, uh, and it just didn't click with yeah. the, the two of us. Uh, it was, it's strange enough. Before I left, I think we became very good friends and, and maintained a friendship throughout our professional lives, and that, that was, that's been nice. Um, but uh, yeah, I got there and I was I was trying to keep my head above water. You know, mm-hmm. I'd been out of school for a few years. You know, like I said, I hadn't been a great student. It was like, oh, all of a sudden I get this high in statistics courses mm-hmm. and you know, hey. this theory course I have to deal with and those kinds of things. And so I was like, keep my head above water. And I was taking a, uh, a class and it was a handful of graduate students in a larger undergraduate class where we had to do a special paper. Uh, the graduate students did, uh, and it was a, a social demography class um, taught by Jakob Singelman. Mm-hmm. Um, and Yachman uh, just casually said to us, you know, you should do a paper for this course. It should be like a conference um, um, style or a level paper. And uh, coming from a small liberal arts college, it completely freaked me out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, but I was fortunate because, you know, remember I had followed Jeff Reynolds there, my, my undergraduate teacher. So I went to Jeff like, what was it? Just Help calm me. down. It'll be mm-hmm. fine. Don't worry it's about it. It's good to hear yeah. that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Our mentors have also had those moments where we needed to be calmed down, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know that was me in graduate yeah, school. It was, it was very much important that he was yeah. there for me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and we talked about possible papers, and this became a social demography class. And while we're talking about somewhere along the line, I ended up in a conversation with uh, Mike Gherkin, who was another mm-hmm. graduate student there. And, and Mike and I talked about it. And eventually I settled on, he was going to do a paper on demography and you know, like, yeah. what about migration what about something mm-hmm. on migration and crime mm-hmm. and, and, and patterns and you know did a little reading and found out that it was a long long literature on migration and crime well um, Mike Gerken was very interested in the topic oh that's an interesting topic and we talked a lot about it and, um, long before my stat course um, got there um, that first fall in graduate school uh, Mike taught me regression mm-hmm. uh, and said you ought to do a paper that looks like this and we talked through that paper um, and I made it through that class with using that paper. It was a paper on migration and crime. Uh, and then um, that paper became my master's thesis. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, by that time, uh, he was working for Walt Gove. Uh, and he said, you ought to ask Walt to, uh, to, to be your advisor for your graduate uh, for the MA. Um, and, I, and I started working with Walt a little bit. But in many ways, for that paper, uh, Walt, uh, Mike was the, dr- the mm-hmm. prime advisor. Mm-hmm. He, was a C- he was a more advanced graduate student, but it was Mike I would go to uh, how to for do the, this, da- the questions, the questions and, the, and those mm-hmm. kinds of things. It was Mike uh, and, and Jeff Reynolds, two advanced graduate students who were, you know, my intellectual guiding stars on, on that project. Um, when the MA thesis was finished, uh, uh, Walt was certainly an involved advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, the secondary reader, um, the additional reader, was, was a man named Mayor Zald, mm-hmm. who was not a criminologist, but, but um, uh, was an organization's person, but was widely read and you know, brilliant intellectual. Uh, I was fortunate to have his, his influence, too. So essentially, my advisors for my MA were neither a criminologist, both sociologists, mm-hmm. Walt's interested in deviant behavior, uh, became interested in crime and criminology, but more um, became interested in crime and criminology because of uh, the pressure of, from Mike Gherkin's interests, uh, Mike Hughes's interests, and, and eventually my interests. So the three of us were interested in crime, and Walt sort of um, uh, became increasingly interested in crime because he had this group of students who were interested in it. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so, so I found myself there, and then I, I found myself um, reading more about crime too, not only because mm-hmm. of that paper, but. but um, 
um, members of the faculty and graduate students thought, oh, you were a par parole officer. Yeah. So they asked me questions they about crime. You to know. And, and I didn't know, you know, like uh -huh. they were asking me questions that I didn't know anything, so uh -huh. I've got to read something to figure out, you know, how to answer these questions. And so that's my backdoor entry into criminology. So. Yeah, because one would think, just looking at your background, that you were always interested yeah. in crime. Maybe you, you were a sociology undergraduate major back then. Did they even have criminology majors? Not it wasn't necessarily, not a major right? Class. But yeah. then you went on to yeah. the PO stuff, and yeah. people might have assumed, oh, well, you had this interest. Yeah. But it's really interesting to see how it developed. Yeah. Kind Kind of uh, more, more randomly. Yeah, backed in that way. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. And so your experiences at Vanderbilt were typical of graduate students, or yeah, yeah? I, I, I d developed really close friendships with a very small cohort. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of uh, some of the folks I was in school with were still very close now. So, so in, that, in that regard, it was, it was a good thing. I. Uh, when did the labor markets come in? Oh, much later. Much uh, later. Much, much later, yeah. So, so your dissertation focused on My dissertation on what? was on mental health. It was wow, on you really are truly <laughs> interested in a lot of different well, I, topics. I mean, it was, you know, the, the interesting thing about that was, was, was uh, uh, Walt Gove had a suggestion for me on, on, a, on a, um, uh, a dissertation topic. And it was really sort of fascinating. Uh, he had found in, in some work he was doing, you know, just in passing, that um, African Americans who um, felt that they had been discriminated against uh, had better mental health than African Americans who felt like they hadn't been discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And we talked about it and, and thought, oh, what's going on here? And my, my first thought, and he, and he agreed with it, was that, um, was that um, you know, the fact of the matter is, African Americans, using a national, national survey data, were um, you know, running up the social, the social structural barriers mm -hmm. and, 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 and the impediments of being uh, in, in, a, in a racially stacked society. Uh, and if you thought you were uh, discriminated against, you it was an external attribution. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't my failure. Right. I'm, in, I'm in, a, in a social mm -hmm. world that's sort of prohibiting me from having uh, the life I want. But if you felt like uh, uh, you're not being discriminated against, that you're still running into a racist society, it must be me. Mm -hmm. And then people will turn it into an internal attribution. Well, someone had told me, had warned me, uh, don't do a, a, a dissertation on race because he says um, African Americans, you know, we're calling ourselves African Americans, mm -hmm. black people always get trapped into d to mm. studying only race. So don't be the black, one more black guy. So this guy was meant race. to be good advice to, to you, yeah, mentoring. Right, you know, stay away from it. Stay away from race. And so, so listening to that says, no, I don't want to do that. You know, in many ways, I wish I did. That would have mm -hmm. been a very good dissertation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you I, wanted you know, to study race. I wasn't sure. I was, just, you know, yeah. you know, I was, I was, I was interested in social movements. I wasn't not interested in race and social movements. I hadn't really got. But it, it wasn't point. necessarily right, right. It wasn't nothing. Something that wasn't something I was looking to do. But it was this advice: mm -hmm. avoid this. And it's, women of that generation got similar advice. They were told, "Don't study the family," mm -hmm. uh, because women get get channeled right. and locked into to studying, you know, family and then later gender issues. Um, and so, so I did a dissertation on on, on mental health mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, and, and drug use, uh, and, and, and you know, but not um, drug use. As, you know, people say drug use. They think heroin, crack, you know, right. cocaine. There was no crack then, uh, but mm -hmm. you know, um, but it was normal drug use. It was alcohol. It was cigarettes. It was marijuana primarily, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and found that essentially people uh, used uh, drugs uh, at low levels uh, as a rather effective coping strategy. A self-medication thing. The big finding got mm -hmm. all of one paper out of uh, out of the well. The one paper got you a job at University of Washington. Actually, actually no? I don't think it did. You I, don't. I, no. What I, What do you think got you the job? I think what got me the interview at Washington was the migration and crime paper, because uh -huh. uh, uh, it was I, I, I'd written it and um, it wasn't yet published, but it was. Um, in, in review, and I guess it was you my simple it submitted as your, as Interesting writing. that you submitted that instead of, or I guess you could have submitted that. The dissertation that. wasn't far enough along. I was never mm -hmm. excited about it. It was a dissertation that I was doing because I was doing a dissertation. Wow, um, that's interesting. But, yeah. uh, but yeah, the migration of kind of paper, which remember began as my, uh, my first year in graduate school as, as, as a course paper. Um, mm -hmm. So it became a master's thesis in my first publication, and I think it's the paper that got me the interview at, at Washington. And, and what, so let's move on to Washington. Okay. And uh, what was Washington like for you? What, what, um, and you've been, you were there how many years? Because I can't for, do the math this for, early for, in the morning. Forever, 37. 37, 37 years. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, so obviously a good experience for you. 
um, especially in this day and age where people tend to move around mm -hmm. a lot. What are some of the highlights of your experience at University of Washington? Well, first I should say that you know Vanderbilt had a habit when I was there. Of, uh, there were a number of people who they did not um, give a second three-year contract to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there were several people who became quite notable sociologists who did, they didn't give tenure to. And so my expectation was, okay, you get a first job, you go someplace, and you don't get, you know, either don't get renewed or you don't get tenure, and you move on from there. And I thought, okay. That's the norm. Yeah, yeah it's mm -hmm. norm. And so Washington was, uh, was far and away the best place that you know, gave, that made me a job offer. Uh, and I thought, yeah, I won't probably succeed there, but I want, I want to take my swings in the big leagues. I want to take, mm -hmm. take my shot at the big time. So, I'll go there. So what if I strike out? I'll just try it. So I didn't expect to be there that long, and I was. Um, so I got there, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm colleagues with people uh, like uh, like Ted Blaylock, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and there was a great, great group of criminologists there. Um, small group. Who was there? Uh, Joe Weiss uh, was there. Clarence Schrag was there. Uh, um, uh, Rod Stark, who was really sort of principle early on. Oh, uh, right. He wrote yeah. the 1987 criminology piece on yeah. social disorganization right, theory, right, yeah, kinds yeah, of yeah, places right. theory. We did some stuff together. Uh, and until that time, the only uh, sort of big name criminologist that I really knew was Jack Gibbs. Uh -huh. who, Jack had come to Vanderbilt too late in my time uh, there for him to be one of my advisors. Um, but, but, but Jack gave good advice on how to do a career. And I spent some time with Jack mm -hmm. in, in the back end of my graduate career. So, but, so uh, so, 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 um, but until then, you know, uh, I, I didn't know anyone really in criminology uh, besides Jack. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and I, you know, I, was, I started doing more moving work in that direction. Um, uh, and so it was a natural fit to go there and um, begin working with Joe Weiss, um, begin working with Rod Stark. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that's how I sort of Got started going. emerging and developing an identity as a criminologist. Um, it was because um, Joe looking at me my first year was, what do you mean you're not going to the crim meetings? Mm -hmm. um, and because I had never been to ASC <laughs> uh, until my second year in graduate school. That's right, he was an old pro at those meetings. Yeah. When did George Bridges come into the mix? I was uh, in uh, my, my second year at, at, at Washington, I was literally the only assistant professor in the department. Uh, and mm -hmm. I chaired a committee, a search committee, looking for a criminologist, and I chaired that search You committee. hired George? I, 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 I chaired a committee that hired George, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that was good. That was great a great hire, yeah, great was, hire, was, great decision. Yeah, that was good for both of us. Um, now, so when did, I still am not getting the answer to the labor markets question. It still comes later, you know, it, it, it does. <laughs> keep, uh, on and, yeah, yeah. keep on few going, keep on going. A few more years. Because as a grad, let me explain why I'm asking this, because as a graduate student when I came to the University of Washington and was looking around and figuring out who to work with, I read, you know, the work of Bob. And I mean, the, the work on labor market, labor markets and violent crime, and that was so formative for me personally, yeah. even though I didn't go into that area, but that's sort of how I know you. Yeah, it, 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 um, it, And so it's, it's so, I'm surprised that it, it happened so late. It, it wasn't so late, it was a few years after. It was, it was okay. before I came up for tenure, the interest started. Actually, the interest was there, mm -hmm. uh, and, but, but it really sort of hadn't flowered. Um, and so, so I was beginning to be interested uh, in um, uh, the work that was going on. There was a debate by, you know, Blau and Blau had written a paper on uh, um, uh, inequality, mm -hmm. income inequality and violent crime. Uh, and a number of people had responded, uh, debating that no, it's poverty. And right, so this, the this, absolute this, relative you know, debate. Right, right, yeah. Debate between poverty and inequality, and I thought that was interesting, and, and I thought something's missing here. I was dabbled in a paper with a colleague, uh, this demographer, uh, Jim McCann, mm -hmm. uh, and um, we kept messing with it, but it didn't flower until a little bit later because something else got in the way before that. Uh, and then I'll come back to the labor yeah. market and the crime because that's something else that's sort of been a repeating something else throughout my career. And what happened was that a paper came out by uh, uh, Christensen that said that Washington state, state led the nation in the over imprisonment of blacks. Uh, and when Washington, the people in Washington, political leaders in Washington were like, how can this be? Right. We are progressive Washington. Totally. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and someone in the Truman administration years earlier had described uh, uh, 
the United States at that time was the, the 47 states in the Soviet of Washington. Uh, and, so, and so with that self-image, and Washington was very proud of that. You know, how could it be with the, somebody was writing saying, in terms of uh, racism, you know, we had the most racist criminal justice system in the country. And I responded like a lot of other people do, like, you know, like, yeah, we, you know what's going on, you, got, you, got, you have bias. Mm -hmm. um, and there were people calling for a study, and I thought, we don't need another study, we need yeah. to do something about it. Uh, and then uh, uh, an African-American uh, person, met, who had come in a mentor at Washington, who was, um, uh, in the, who was the dean of the School of Public Affairs, Hubert, Hubert Locke, um, was very politically connected, and someone came, in the legislature came to him and said that the legislature had committed uh, money to do a study of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Washington State's criminal justice system, mm -hmm. if that was correct, and why it was correct. And remember, I'd said, we don't need another study, we need to take action. Uh, Professor Locke uh, called me and said, Bob, I want you to do the study. And suddenly when the money was there, I said, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> so, so, so remember, the, the do not study race. Right, uh, and this is really what, what the beginnings of your second area of right, interest, right, race yeah, and ethnicity right, and the criminal right, justice system. That's exactly yeah. where it came from. And so, 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 so Locke asked me if I would do the study, and I said, um, one condition, uh, could I bring my new colleague, George Bridges, in to work on it with me? Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, sure, if that's what you want to do. I says, you know, George knows criminal justice much better, more than I, so mm -hmm. than I do, because you know, that was an area of his. And so George and I started right working on uh, race uh, um, and, uh, and the criminal justice system. And it's actually sort of been this sort of, you know, I would, it, it, was, it was never my primary area of interest. Right. Um, but it, it, it happens and it comes back and somebody says, well, will you do a piece on this? And, mm -hmm. and so it's throughout my career, uh, it's been this, uh, will you um, take this piece on? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and, and I, you, I remember you and George getting large grants and then hiring us grad students on the pretrial detention and yeah, the bail yeah, yeah, and yeah. all of that. And, 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 we got a lot of training through those projects. And, 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 and actually the way it went is, is it was an interest in, and I, I think that that work got both George and myself got ten. Got us, we got tenure on based on the, on that on those projects, um, but George stuck with it. It became mm -hmm. his major area mm -hmm. of interest, his major area, and 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 I diverged back to other stuff. But it but it, it never it left. It, it, never, it left. never left. It, it kept coming back. And so 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 contrary to that advice I got that I. I, I mistakenly listened to when I was a graduate student and didn't do the race and mental health thing, I found myself becoming a, a race and criminal justice scholar and mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm very happy that I did. Oh, I, I, I'm very happy that we are a, 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 an area of study now where young scholars don't get told, don't study race, you know, that, that, that it's now you know, has cachet and it's important and everybody says you can't be serious about criminology mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in America. If yeah, what take, a different if you, time. If you're going to take not going to race seriously and I, and I hope I've contributed a little bit to that. But again, that was a backdoor yeah. way in too because I, I, I got advice not to do it and I'm really glad I walked away from that advice. Yeah, but you didn't just do it with the research because you've been involved in a number yeah. of, yeah. you know, National Academies panels, the yeah. Racial Democracy Crime and Justice yeah. Network yeah. you're very involved in. Yeah. So not just the research but the infrastructure yeah. um, building that is necessary and, in the field, and, I think. And in a lot of ways, I think I'm more proud of that than anything yeah. else. That I've been a part of that group that sort of helped uh, change that. I mean, a number of us have worked together to, to, to change uh, that narrative within criminology. I'm glad. But you did end your career, not that you're not working now, but you did sort of end it with your book on labor markets. Right. And it, so can I guess I want I want to make sure that the viewers hear a bit about that work. No, happy to. And what your sort of key, what, what it is that you want us to know from your work on labor markets, but especially from your most recent book. Okay. What's the takeaway? Well, well so when I said I, I worked on race and criminal justice with George, and I mm -hmm. said he kept going with that, and uh, I went back to other things, what I went back to was that early was that labor markets and crime interest because remember the income inequality, right, and poverty, poverty thing. Mm -hmm. And what I by, by that time I thought what was missing was uh, this notion of uh, of work because if you think about how we define ourselves, not just academics, uh, certainly not people who are involved in crime, but everybody in this society mm -hmm. and everybody in every society that I'm familiar with, we define ourselves not just, but in some significant ways by what we do. Oh, that's the first question you right. ask yeah. when you it's, meet it's, someone it's, it's, at a it's, bar. It's Hi, I'm so-and-so, what do you do? Right. So <laughs> how can we be talking about right. crime and um, poverty or income inequality without talking about labor markets? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, with poverty, 
is really a measure of is one's position in the labor market. Mm -hmm. You are in poverty because you either have no job, you have no work, or you have work that, that's so low paid that you're still impoverished. Um, What's, what's with a city's income inequality? A city has uh, uh, high levels of income inequality uh, if uh, the labor market structure has jobs that, 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 stacked. that, that, that are stacked mm -hmm. in ways that create that inequality. And so, so when looking at that debate that people were having, what I kept thinking was, uh, I grew up in, as I said earlier, in Pittsburgh, that uh, at that time had a relatively low crime rate for major cities. And, and what did it have? It had the steel industry. Mm -hmm. This very robust, booming industry um, going on where there was lots of blue collar jobs. Mm -hmm. This classic, well -paid, classic good, good Rust Belt, mm -hmm. good jobs, well paid, good benefits. What was a city, and just an example of a city that, that, that had high income inequality and high crime rates? Miami, Florida. And what was Miami's labor market like? Well, it had a lot of high-end places. But Miami has always been a financial capital. Mm -hmm. you know, some people have described it as the economic capital of Latin America. Uh, right. and some people have suggested. And, and so it had a lot of people making a lot of money. And you know, if you go to Miami now, you see it in those tall buildings. Mm -hmm. But if you go in the neighborhoods of Miami, what you see, you see people in deep poverty mm -hmm. as well. And what it has is it has a labor market that looks a lot like really high-end people and the people who service them. Right. So you have that high inequality. And so I started thinking, well, maybe what's going on to some extent here is, is, um, is not, not primarily income inequality or not primarily poverty. I'm not saying those things aren't important. Right. Um, but, but an important part of the story that I thought had been left out was, was um, the, the, the structure of the labor market. Um, so that was, that's how I got interested in mm -hmm. that. And so to, to come back to the book, the big story of the book is that you know, when I, when I started reading in that area, I found that there was a lot of people had looked at unemployment and crime, mm -hmm. and that the findings were inconsistent. Some people found uh, unemployment uh, was related to higher levels of crime. Other people found uh, you know, no relationship. This is at the individual level or at the aggregate both, level, or both. It doesn't it matter? Uh -huh. with, with, with both. And, 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 uh, and then even um, uh, um, the early. Um, the early routine activities people suggested for some crimes, uh, unemployment was actually uh, positive. Right. It was, was actually a positive factor. It was negatively related to crime because for, for burglary, the uh, it was a guardianship thing going on. So, so there's this, this mishmash. And so, so, so it wasn't simply whether people had jobs or not. And that's what took me to, uh, outside of criminology, to another area of sociology to study going back to being like a graduate student mm -hmm. reading stratification and leaving the, uh, reading the uh, dual labor market theorists and, 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 and segmented labor market stuff. Your true sociological identity. Uh, yeah. and, and actually was, <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. For me, it was uh -huh. one of those things that said, this is the value of having um, uh, a broad-based uh, training. This is the value of being able to uh, be able to go to colleagues. And I, I was fortunate to be at a place like Washington where I had colleagues who really knew that stuff. And I could mm -hmm. go and talk to them, but we spoke the same language. Right. Um, and that, that's that, that's not a veiled shot at people who are in crim programs by any mm -hmm. stretch. But I think the best crim programs are places that have really good social scientists in them, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and they'll have a combination of people who have that kind of mm -hmm. colleagues. You know, so. So I, you know, so for me, I was fortunate to be in a, in a good sociology department with, with, with good colleagues, um, but I think that kind of broad-based sort of uh, training is, is good for people when you're a student, and it's certainly good for people uh, when you're early in your career because you need those other those other influences. Mm -hmm. You need you need uh, uh, those people who sort of take you out of your Oh, absolutely. So, so, so that was fortunate. That yeah, you really were in the best of both worlds because it wasn't like you were the sole person interested in criminology in the sociology department, there were right. a few of you, right. but you were also in a broader intellectual right. environment right. that allowed you to, like you said, yeah. explore. Right, and, and, and that was very helpful. And, and, and that's where the labor stratification and crime stuff come from. It, was, it, came, it came from, in, in, in like the marriage of, 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 of segmented labor market uh, theories in, 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 mm -hmm. in, the, in the study of stratification uh, with uh, uh, a bit of control theory, uh, a bit of social disorganization theory, uh, some routine activity stuff. And so, so I wasn't trying to come up with an integrated theoretical approach or anything like that, but so much as like, like you know, what are these things that fit together in criminology mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what's, what's stratification? Uh, and say, so, so how do labor market patterns affect, affect people? And it was, and, 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 and critical to that was, it wasn't just um, unemployment, employment. Mm -hmm. Critical to that was 
was uh, the notion that uh, uh, it was the quality of work that people had. Yeah. And you know, basic basic control theory sorts of notions. You know, if you have uh, good work and, and you have um, high quality work and you have work that's really valued by you and by others, and it doesn't have to be professional work. You mm -hmm. know, those steel worker jobs that other people in Pittsburgh, right. those auto worker jobs uh, in, in places like Detroit, these are jobs that you build a life around. You know, they, mm -hmm. they call them family wage. The politicians call them family wage jobs now, and, and you know, and it gives you. Uh, in, in, in the language of control theory, uh, a stake in conformity. Mm -hmm. You know, you have something to lose. But if, if, if you're um, uh, on the margins of the labor market, if you're you know, out of work, if you're in and out of work, if you uh, uh, are uh, in what have popularly now become mic jobs, mm -hmm. those fast food jobs, those low end jobs, with the stratification people refer to as second, in the secondary sector of the labor market, you have low pay, you have uh, no benefits, you have no, no uh, uh, don't have a, a job structure that's going to give you benefits and opportunities and those kinds of things. Uh, that that structures your lifestyle. Right. And so, so I'm not. I, you know, my arguments aren't uh, people at the low end, so they get angry, they go out and commit crimes, but rather um, the mm -hmm. lifestyles are structured by what you do. Um, you know, if you think about most academics. Um, our day-to-day -day life is structured by this wonderful jobs we get to have. Yeah, you know, you know, you, 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 you know. For years, I was a runner, and uh, and I got to, you know, get up, do some work, go out for a run. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have a nine-to-five job, you don't get to go out for a run mid-morning. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're an academic, you know, if, if your teaching schedule allows you to, uh, you can do your work whenever. So you can do those things. It's a little thing, but 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 in large measure, our lives are structured by what we do. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for people in the secondary sector of, of the labor market. And, and, and my argument was when, particularly when young people, particularly young men, are living in circumstances where, um, where uh, uh, their, their lifestyles are structured by the, that lack of attachment to the labor mm -hmm. market, there are situations where crime becomes more likely. Mm -hmm. And so they don't I like problems. that your focus is not necessarily on that they get angry and lash out, no, it, but it, it's a social control perspective right. that, that it builds very nicely with the opportunity structure of jobs. Right. It, it's clearly the case that some of them probably are getting angry and lashing yeah, out, right. but, but I think it's far more likely it's to, that, That's the simplistic argument right. that one it's, would it's say, oh, well, that, they're, you know, yeah. yeah. I, I was interviewed after the after the Rodney King riots when the police officers were acquitted for beating a Rodney King both by a local uh, uh, TV uh, uh, news show in Seattle, and uh, the, um, the, the, the the talking head who is now uh, uh, an official in one of the political parties turns to me and says very dismissively, "Well, aren't they all just thugs?" Mm -hmm. And I didn't respond as my heart told me to at the moment. And I responded sociologically and criminologically instead, and I said, "But isn't the critical question, you know, if they're thugs, why they became thugs?" Uh, you know, mm -hmm. thugs is this racially charged, just dismissive sort of uh, term that people use popularly sometimes. And and I, and I went in the direction of a labor market explanation. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, maybe these people are angry, but maybe you should think about the uh, that that verdict being, you know, um, uh, a spark that lits uh, an already charged circumstance. Right. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and it's and it's the, the labor strat vacation perspective that I was arguing, uh, superimposed on with the organization theory people are about, because mm -hmm. we're talking about context. Because people don't live in isolation uh, in, in these marginal positions of the labor market, they tend to live together mm -hmm. in, in, in neighborhoods who are clustered together and in, 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 um, uh, in, in very disadvantaged neighborhoods. And so you get, a, you know, not just one or two people, but you end up with this concentrated um, sort of uh, Concentration of people who are marginal to to, to, to the labor market, larger mm -hmm. marginal to the good life, marginal to real chances, marginal to opportunities, and all these things, um, and you um, add race to that mix, mm -hmm. and then you add a spark of a, 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 of the acquittal of police officers who were caught on camera mm -hmm. uh, um, beating a man who's on the ground and helpless, uh, and. Uh, and it exploded. Yeah. And so, so, so what I said to her that evening was, you know, you, you really need to think about how they end up in the circumstance where they're rioting, uh, you know, and not just dismiss. Uh, and, and it, so that comes out. Yeah, I mean, I'm just as you're saying this, I'm, and I'm thinking about Rodney King. Um, you know, the, every single thing that you are saying is as applicable today as it yeah, was absolutely. for Rodney King, yeah, right. if not more so. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's what's going on in inner cities uh, in response to. Police shootings of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of 
black people, primarily black men, but not just black men, uh, and, 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 and demonstrations occur or, uh, or, uh, or, or, or rioting occurs. And, and um, you know, Amer the American mainstream gets upset. Mm -hmm. uh, the American mainstream should be really happy when it's demonstrations mm -hmm. uh, because this country's you know, done this toxic mix mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and left it in place. And you know, shock of shocks when a spark sets it off and, and these repeated sparks can lead to a real strong reaction that if you uh, bother to, to really pay attention to what's going on in those places, it, it's, it's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that such things happen. Let me go back to one thing that you said a few minutes ago um, that struck me, which is that this person, this reporter, or was it, I think it was the reporter, said, well, aren't they just a bunch of thugs, mm -hmm. right? And, and r there's a racial, mm -hmm. obviously, component there, mm -hmm. but he's speaking or she was speaking to you as a black man. Yeah. I, I, want, I, I was thinking about sort of insider-outsider status uh, on this, and I guess one thing I'd like to ask a question about, I hope you don't think it's too personal, but for you to reflect a little bit on your experience as a black man in academia. Yeah. And, and I know, I mean, we could have a whole interview on that, but for me, I, I guess I would just like to hear, I, I just can't imagine some of the challenges you know, as a white woman, what some of the challenges, I, I can't even begin to know what question to ask, but I guess I would like for you to say something about that, your experience about that. It is, and will remain for a long time, it's a contested area. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's not easy. I, th I think most departments really get that they should have diversity now. Mm -hmm. But too often diversity is defined as add a few brown people and stir them in. Mm -hmm. In other words, add brown people and you know, hopefully they'll be just like us and then nothing will, will, mm -hmm. will fundamentally change. Well, that's really not diversity because you know, the reason you know, diversity has value is uh, the sort of the, the cross-mixing, the heterogeneity of, of ideas and intellect and all kinds of things and points of view uh, that makes for a rich environment. So when I, when I talked about the value of being in a good sociology department where I could go talk to scholars who were studying stratification about things, that kind of heterogeneity of, 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 of ideas and, and things are a good thing. Well, you need it too. Uh, and and um, when when you um, um, think about lots of things, and that's why racial diversity in the academy is is a good thing because mm -hmm. you bring those points of view together. Now, I've read horrendous things. Uh, some, some 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 of our colleagues will say, uh, for, you know, easy example. An easy example are, are people who who continue to say, oh, we're not quite sure what's going on here because we have this 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 black violent crime. Uh, significant relationship uh, and none of our variables explain mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. so it must be a subculture mm -hmm. and I'm like <laughs> you know and that's why that's why you heard me early on refer to it as the black box theory of criminology mm -hmm. where we don't know anything else we say it must be a subculture right well you know come on mm -hmm. what do you mean by that uh, you know, you know can, can we really sort of interrogate that and think through it? But it was just too easy to, to, mm -hmm. to do that. That's the fallback explanation. Yeah, right. You know, mm -hmm. and, and it's like, it, it, so, and it, it's, it's a lot of people uh, to, to talk too frequently. I'm not saying everyone who's talked about writes about subcultures this way, mm -hmm. to, to talk about it in ways which avoid talking about social structure. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the contrast, it must be a subculture with um, emerging ethnographies. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not an ethnographer, but we, we all know that there's some great ethnographies being written by criminologists and sociologists or germane to crime and the study of crime. Uh, and what they're finding is, yeah, values and norms in, 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 in places of concentrated poverty uh, concentrated disadvantage are important, but you know. But if you think about the work of Eli Anderson, mm -hmm. how that uh, those 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 sort of that normative structure, that normative pattern emerges exactly. out of structured it's inequality. It's not separate from right, it. Right, right, right. It, it's a product of that structured inequality. Mm -hmm. The social structure is really what's push, pushing what's going on. And so, yeah, it's, you end up with these feedback loops, which you, you, you bring the, the structured inequality um, center stage, and so you make it a, a responsible part of the story. Right. Where if you just write it off a subculture, you're not terribly different. You're mm -hmm. much more 
elegant in how you say it mm-hmm. than that reporter did. But in some ways, you're saying, aren't they just thugs? This you is know, the like know. sort of intergenerational poverty, right, right, or right, this, right, right. yeah. yeah. The... But, but, but intergenerational poverty is the oh, this passing down of subculture. Exactly. Like, well, but with the same families are intergenerationally experienced structured inequality. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Why aren't they passing the structure right, down? Right, right, the yeah, structure is right, being right, passed yeah, down so, in some way. So, so anyway, so, uh-huh. so there's all that. So, so, so back to your question about race and and and. Uh, uh, in, in the academy, um, it's 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 a hard place to be. Still, it's mm-hmm. better than it was, but mm-hmm. it's a hard place to be. Still, I, I said early on that, that I was lucky to be in a good department, but, but I was also in a department where um, um, where there was an attempt by students to have uh, at Washington a, a, a diversity requirement requirement mm-hmm. in terms mm-hmm. of their course requirement, and a group of faculty rose up and opposed it, and. Um, some members of my department were principal in opposing, opposing that degree, and they put up a petition, and they put it on the mailbox door of, of where the faculty mailboxes were, and I had to every day go and look right, at, right at, at mm-hmm. my colleagues signing up to of, of, you know, oppose um, uh, um, this, this diversity requirement. And I'm not going to say that, you know, maybe they had some decent arguments, but, but for me that felt like a slap in the mm-hmm. face. And it particularly felt like a slap in the face that it was like right there and no one had the decency uh-huh. to say, um, uh, you know, this okay, is not the best place, place to post this. Place this mm-hmm. We're going to do it. You know, just cluelessness. Um, uh, another colleague of, of mine, Judy Howard, and I, um, when we were fairly junior, repeatedly would say, you know, we need to hire someone else. Uh, studying race, mm-hmm. you know, and and in, no one would argue with us. It just wouldn't go anywhere, you know, just sort of flat. And so, so you would get that. Um, in terms of, um, uh, in, in within uh, the larger discipline, um, we a couple of us used to joke that when um, people want looking for people on a committee, oh, we need diversity on a committee, and there were three people they would turn to, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of people who were doing quantitative work. Uh, in criminology, they would say, "Oh, ask Ruth Peterson. Yeah. Ask Darnell Hawkins. Ask Bob." Well, this Crutchfield. is partly why your service record right, is right, yeah, absolutely it, 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 over it, it, the top. And, and Ruth mm-hmm. and Darnell, as and I, Ruth and Darnell's is right, and yeah. we would laugh about it. It was always a three, you know. And we, it wasn't just us because Cormay Ritchie, a uh, mm-hmm. uh, man earlier on, Julius Debro mm-hmm. earlier on, sort of paved the way for us. So we, you know, we weren't. The, you right, know, the, the, the vanguard. But it but, wasn't like there were, you know, right, tons and right, tons right. of people. Yeah, and yeah we, but we were that, in academia. We were uh-huh. the next tier, and and so in, in many ways it was a lonely place because you could be in a conversation with people saying we're going to talk about violence. So we well, need to take race seriously about violence, and you would have scholars say, why do we have to pay attention to race? Mm-hmm. You know, like you know, isn't it just another variable? Uh, or or people would say, okay, let's throw um, percent non-white in as if right. You know, I, you it's know, just this. Done that I know. Work, I've done it too. But 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 why? You know, mm-hmm. and 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 and, 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 and so, sociologically and criminologically, uh, for most of the questions we're asking, it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. But we just do it dismissively. Mm-hmm. So so and so in lots of ways, you know, it 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 becomes central to uh, one's identity as an academic. You know, lots of service work, not only the stuff that's on my CV, but mm-hmm. um, you, the you, invisible you, service yeah, work. Yeah, you know, it's it's the number of, of of students who come to talk to you about uh, their academic work and tell them to talk to you about their home life mm-hmm. and, and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and how they, they are in the world, you know, because uh, suddenly they have somebody who's a faculty member who looks like them. And in, in most of my white colleagues are shocked when they hear how much it is. And, it, and it's much worse for, uh, you know, uh, women of color in the mm-hmm. academy because, mm-hmm. you know, they get the double whammy because female faculty members get similar kind of, you know, more students going to them for women are nurturing, women are supporting, mm-hmm. blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. You know, and then, then if it's a woman of color, they, they, get, they get lots and lots of that. So there's all this yeah. invisible work that goes on. Uh, and, and, um, and there's not a lot of credit for it. Yeah. You know? And now that, uh, that we are diversifying faculties even more, which is a great thing, um, add to the mix um, that I typically um, um, spend a significant amount of my time talking to, to my colleagues, not just junior colleagues, but uh, I had a meeting yesterday at Washington with a, a full professor in another department who wanted my advice about mm-hmm. a career thing. You know, and it's just it's it's the nature of, of being part of the you know. Yeah, I mean, and I asked this question because my experience working with you over the years mm-hmm. and as your student was that you handled all of this and didn't. I never got glimpses in 
to how difficult some of these issues were. Now that I'm older, and, and I'm sure I contributed to them. I, I remember, like I said, when we were at your retirement party a week ago, I remember it when I was saying in my speech, I would come in and ask you all these questions, yeah. just personal questions, because I was curious, right? I mean, those must have emotionally taken a toll along with everything else. But I never, I never felt um, as I was working with you and learning from you that that uh, that that we never had deep discussions about that. And no. now, as I'm older, I, no. I I I think it's important and it needs to be acknowledged. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, you know, and it's 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 what we it's what some of us do. Everyone didn't do it. Mm -hmm. A lot of us did do it. Uh, and 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 a lot of people have contributed to that. And so you know, and and, and there's not a lot of rewards that come from the discipline for doing that stuff, mm -hmm. for, from sociology or for criminology, it's just, it's just what you do. But one of the most rewarding things I've had an opportunity to do uh, in, in my career was be a part of uh, the group that established the Racial Democracy Crime and Justice Network. Um, for those that don't know, uh, RDCJN, uh, which was largely uh, nurtured and established and pushed forward by Ruth Peterson and Lori Crevo, uh, and for 10 years, you know, we met at Ohio State, and you're a part of the group. Uh, and it's you know a group of, of scholars who have together tried to improve um, intellectually what we do in mm -hmm. ter terms of as a group about studying race, crime, and justice, uh, but also to mentor scholars um, both uh, of color and not of color who are interested in studying these topics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so the workshop that, that, that RDCJ has, has done. Um, and, and all that, uh, and that's been really rewarding. And you know, the fact that the National Science Foundation has, has supported RDCJN has been incredible. Uh, you know, we moved to uh, the second phase of it uh, now that it's moved from Ohio State to Rutgers, uh, the guidance of Jody Miller and Rod Brunson. And so it's going. And, you know, oh yeah, going to and you meetings. see RDCJN members right. everywhere. everywhere. Ruth right. as yeah. president, Eric uh, Stewart as vice president, president. right? Various right. of us yeah. in council positions, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, board positions. Yeah. Right, yeah, you know, Jody Miller is now uh, exactly. a, a, a new vice president of ASC. So, so you see these things. You see members of RDCJN becoming fellows of ASC mm -hmm. uh, in, in those positions. You walk around uh, the ASC meetings. Uh, and you see people who are members of that network, uh, and so uh, you know, you know, Ruth and Darnell and I joked about how often we were looked to for these things. And there's now this whole array of people, right? And and having to contribute, having contributed a little bit to that, mm -hmm. I, I find immensely rewarding. I'm not going to quite say that it's made up for the fact that. Uh, um, my department, my university, uh, the discipline more broadly, um, didn't adequately appreciate what we were doing all those years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the fact that uh, there's this, this, this subsequent generations carrying on, you know, carrying the torches, is, is oh, yeah, quite rewarding. Oh yeah, the infrastructure is there. Yeah, it's, it's quite rewarding. Okay, let me add, let me because uh, I know we're running out of time here. Let me um, end with uh, one one sort of bigger picture question that kind of ties everything together. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, um, so I guess it's always good to leave off with some advice to young scholars, yeah. right? I mean, this is a lot of young people, young scholars starting out will be watching these videotapes and they're looking for nuggets of advice. People of color, people not of color, mm -hmm. right? And I guess I'd like to know what you would suggest to future generations um, that are watching this recording about sort of what it takes to achieve success in, in sociology, criminology, in the field. What are what are you? What are some recommendations, big picture sorts of things that you think um, they would need, they should hear? I, I would I would start with um, take advantage of your own biography, your your own you know where you come from. So going back to that person who dismissively said, "Aren't they just thugs?" I can't help but talk about that and think about um, when the riots occurred all over the country, including mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, uh, after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, Pittsburgh erupted and I was a freshman in college and I spent much of that time riding around with my brother and uh, two of his fraternity brothers in Pittsburgh watching what's going on. We're being you know, young, boneheaded intellectuals, I guess. Um, and, uh, and seeing a fire smoke, being one part of town seeing smoke rising from the, the top of the hill that, you know, where our apartment was and knowing that our mom was there. So mm. we sprinted back there and to find her sitting um, uh, in, in the living room crying because of what was happening in her neighborhood. Um, I can't hear somebody refer to, you know, say thugs or be dismissively talk about subcultures without thinking about 
uh, that good woman who raised us mm -hmm. in, in that less than perfect circumstance um, by herself, you know. Um, um, that's all intimately yeah. connected. Right, it's yeah. tied so, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. so, 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 so that's my biography. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where my biography starts. And so, so what, what part of the advice I would give young folks is use your biography. But at the same time, don't, don't treat your scholarly life as your therapy life. Mm -hmm. You gotta go beyond <laughs> your biography. Uh -huh. the, 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 use your biography, but, it's, but the reason you write a dissertation isn't to um, work out your issues. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's, you, use it to frame mm -hmm. and give, give input to, to, to the, the work you do, the field work you do, the, the modeling you do, the numbers you crunch, how you interpret those things, use, you, you use it. And this is true if you're, uh, you know, if you are of color or not, mm -hmm. male or female, if mm -hmm. you're gay or straight, mm -hmm. uh, I would say use, use it for, for insight and for, for, and for perspective, but, but don't, don't, don't turn it into your therapy. Right. Uh, you know, you, you know, uh, um, uh, the American Sociological Review and Criminology aren't therapeutic organ, organs. They're, 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 for, they're, for, they're for scholarly stuff. But scholarly stuff is, is richer when we use who we are as exactly. people. And I would say the other thing is, is, is be broad in what you um, study and what you learn. So, mm -hmm. so think about it in terms of the tools. And so, so don't get so, I'm interested in this and I'm gonna know this. Right, I'm gonna yeah. use this methodology. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna study me, this theory. It drives me yeah. crazy when, when, when increasingly you get people saying, you, know, you, you ask them, what are you going to work on? They say, well, I'm not sure, but I know I want to uh, I do two things. I want to do qualitative. Uh -huh. <laughs> or they'll say, oh, I want to do mixed methods. And, uh -huh. and, and I like, like to what's ask the question? Them, what's yeah, the research question? question? What's the research question? I, I, I said, mm -hmm. uh, how do you, uh, what would you think um, if somebody said, um, uh, you heard somebody answer that question, what do you want to do? I don't know what I want to do, but I want to use structural equation modeling. You yeah. think that was stupid? It would be stupid. But the fact of the matter is, it's about the question. And then, what tools do you use to address that question? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, we all gravitate to certain tools, right. and we use certain tools more than others. And so, but you shouldn't fetishize your tools. Totally. You should. You should. You know, questions. Have and to you be never know when you're going to need a tool. Right. Right. I mean, you know, you might start off right. being trained this way, right. but then you ask a question that requires something completely right. different. Right. You know, yeah. maybe that's something you can't do. Maybe yeah. You don't. Maybe you're not good at that tool, but that tells you, ah. Uh, Collaborator would be really good. So you know, you, you work with other people, you talk to other people, you do those things. So, so I would say, that, you know, intellectually, that, you know, you, you, we have to specialize. It's the nature of doing science. It's the nature of doing this work. Um, but, but, but have that broader background in terms of tools, um, both not just methods, but but intellectual tools, theoretical tools. Yeah, you know? and I'm not saying mishmash things right. together, but rather, you know, know, know some other areas. You know, you, can, you can begin. I couldn't have done the work uh, that I, I've done on. Uh, labor markets and crime, or uh, race and criminal justice. If I didn't know something about stratification, mm -hmm. if I didn't know something about how organizations work, if I didn't know something about how institutions work, uh, and, the, and the more of those things you have some inkling of, you won't know them well, but you will sometimes know what you don't know, and you'll right. know areas you can go read in, and you know areas where you need to go talk to people, and you can bring that into your work. So I think that's very important. Great. Well, that is fantastic advice. So. I think we are done. Thank you so much, Bob, for your insights. Thank it's you been great. Yeah, right. Thanks. Thanks.